Well, good morning to you. Thanks for choosing to worship with us today. If you would, stand to your feet and let's sing some praises together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. Where nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. There's a better life. There's a better life. 
seated. Praise the Lord, he breaks those chains, amen. And if you've got any this morning, hey, he's ready to break them, amen. Praise God that we can all testify that no Christ, of all the things he's removed from us, that we don't have those chains anymore. So the biggest one is our salvation, amen. We were freed from the chains of sin, and not that we don't sin, but we're broken that chain that uh, for all eternity it will be with him. Good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. Uh, we want to continue to welcome our guests that are joining us online. We're glad that you did, and we ask that you would be sure to click the share button so that the worship and the word and our ministries would be able to get out to more and more people. But we also want to welcome our first-time guests here uh, in the auditorium. We're so glad that you've chosen Believers Fellowship to be part of us and to worship with us, and we're so glad that you're here. As you came in, you should have received a, a welcome card like up on the screen. If you didn't, put one of those uh, in the pocket in the chair in front of you. You can pull one out there and fill it out. Uh, if you would, put a prayer request. If you have anything you'd like us to be praying for, we'd appreciate you doing that and consider it an honor to pray for you in that, in that realm, whatever need you have. And uh, just hang on to that card. Uh, we've got a, a gift that we'd like to give our first-time guest at the end of the service. So just hang on to that, and we'd appreciate it. But right now, we want to welcome our guest to the service. So if this is your first time to ever be at Believers Fellowship, we'd ask you to remain seated. Members, regular attenders, get up where you are and find some of the seats. Make your way back to your seats if you would uh, stand in the honoring of God's word. This is the time in our service that we read the scriptures. And so we've asked Rebecca to come and read our scripture for today. Morning. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, 
so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Father God, I thank you for your word and the freedom and the privilege to be able to read it in this country in public. Father, I pray that your word that was read today and spoken, that you would reveal it to each of our hearts, God, that we are new creatures and that we do see others as you see them, Father. Bless this uh, word that we're going to hear today through the preaching. We ask that you be glorified in all in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship, let's uh, have an additional prayer for our team overseas. Father, we just come to you, Lord, right now, and uh, we lift up our leadership team that's overseas right now. Lord, we just pray for continued protection, use and minister through them and in them, Lord, to accomplish the goal set before them, Father. And Father, we also lift up the Invite Your One that's next Sunday. Father, all those names that are on that board outside and those that hadn't been put up yet, Lord. We just pray, Lord God, that you'd draw those people, Lord. They'd be here next Sunday, Lord. And for those that hadn't, Lord, that they'd have their one here as well, Father. We're lifting that up. We know the enemy fights against us, especially in their area of winning people or drawing people to you or drawing people closer to you. And we just pray right now as a church that you'd just bless that time, Lord. Bless that event, Father, that we'd be able to reach more people for you, that your kingdom would be blessed, Lord, by this event that we're having to draw one more or two more or five more people, Father. Whoever it is, Lord, we want to just be outreach-oriented. So we lift up that event as well and pray that you'd be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue standing as we worship the Lord. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers. Far and wide, but I know we are searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. Who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I can hardly speak the peace so unexplainable I can hardly think and you call me deeper still and you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 
as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 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 You're a good, good father.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for our music team and how they lead us in worship. We praise the Lord for them. Well, good morning. Today we're looking at a topic called Motivation to Multiply. As you heard Rebecca read that verse, it's the ministry of reconciliation. That all of us have been called to that ministry, so we need to pay close attention because it's a ministry that we all have. Uh, some people may be a deacon, some people may be an elder, some people may be a Sunday school teacher, but everybody has the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I've titled this Motivation to Do It because I can preach on it and we may not do it because we're not motivated to do it. Amen? Amen. You know, I find out in counseling, which I do a lot of counseling, I have found out over 26 years of counseling that I believe about 20% what I need to do and end up doing in counseling is telling people what they should do and probably 80% trying to motivate them to do it. Because a lot of people even come in knowing what to do. They just don't do it. I'm really reminding them of things they probably already know. And that doesn't mean that there's not some instruction. Hey, I, you got your problem. Here's what I believe the scripture has to give you counsel. But most of the time, many of the time, is motivating that person to do what they already know to do or what I've instructed them to do. Because they'll come back, well, it's still the same problem. Or there's still the same issue. Well... Did you do what you're supposed to do? So that's the part. That's why I've called this motivation to multiply. I don't believe anybody would disagree with what I'm going to preach on. Amen? Because it's in the Word of God. It's just, are we going to be motivated? And so what I've broke this down into five parts on this passage to show how each of them give us, gives us a little bit of motivation to do it. It's kind of like the guy who the boss man owned a company of 100 employees. He said, Every year that we have 100% participation in the orphan toy drive. Every year we've had 100%. He's always bragged on that as the owner. And so he called in one of his uh, uh, people that worked under him. He said, how are we looking this year? He said, we've only got one employee that hadn't given. Well, go and see if you can convince him. And he went to and tried to convince him. He wouldn't give. He was the only employee. And he went to him again. He went to him again trying to motivate him to give. And so the boss said, the owner said, bring him into my office. So he did. He brought him into his office and he said, hey, uh, I heard you hadn't given to the orphan toy drive. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I want to give to that. And he said, okay. And he said, well, let me explain something. Ever since I've been the owner of this company, we've always had 100% giving to the orphan toy drive ever since I've been here as the owner. He said, and we're going to have 100% this year. He said, either you're going to give and we'll have 100% or you don't and I'm going to fire you and we still have 100% giving. And so the man said, you know what? To the boss, he said, I think I'm going to give. And he said, well, what changed your mind? He said, I've never heard the orphan toy drive explained quite that well before. <laughs> so if you're not motivated by one of these points, hopefully you'll be motivated by another one of these points to do what God's called us to do. And this is for all of us. Uh, I don't see the clicker up here, so I need to. Uh, so we need to find out. And, and this is an area for all of us. That, and I'm, not, I'm talking about pastors, deacons, elders. This is an area in our life that is difficult because it demands us many times getting out of our comfort zone. Amen? Do you have a comfort zone? Thank you. Uh, I do. And it's what? It's comfortable. That's why they call it a comfort zone. It's like, hey, I don't want to step out and do that. That's, uh, that's not in my comfort zone. Well... If you hadn't lived long enough as a Christian, God likes calling you out of your comfort zone in faith and in things that he's called you to do because he gives you the strength to do it. So let's look at the first point of why we should be motivated to multiply. When you, when you know when I'm saying multiply, that's the ministry of reconciliation. That means going out and drawing people to Christ, witnessing, drawing people to church, ministering to people to bring them to the love of Christ. Number one, we should be motivated to multiply because of our love for Christ. That's how he starts. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, that was Jesus, therefore all died, 
and we, uh, it said one died for all, excuse me, one died for all, and therefore all died, and, the, and he, that's Jesus, died for all, so that they will live, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You see, he says, what controls me? The love of Christ. Why do I do what I do? The love of Christ. Why can I have, why can I do the ministry of reconciliation? Because I love Christ. Why can I serve Christ? Because I love Christ. Why am I committed to Christ? Because I, I love him. Why am I faithful to Christ? Because I love him. It just controls me. It just controls me. Have you, that's what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do in our life is control us. Before, who controlled us? We controlled us. I'll go where I want to go. I'll do what I want to do. I'll say what I want to say. I'll react how I want to re react. I'll use my time how I want to use my time. I'll use my money how I want to use my money. And now what happens? We come to Christ and we're saying, Christ, you control it all. You tell me what to do. You tell me what decisions I need to make. That's part of being filled with the Spirit is Him in control. And so he's saying, look, because of Christ's death, I'm, Christ controls me, so whatever he asks me to do, that's what I'll do because in that verse it says, because after he died for me, we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for who? Him. That verse is clear that we don't live for ourselves, but for him. You see, there's the, it, it, just, it, it motivates us. As a matter of fact, Acts says, Paul, I mean, Luke said in Acts, but I do not consider myself, my life of any account as dear to myself. You see, you won't be able to do any of this that I'm going to talk about if your life and my life is so dear to us that it's not controlled by Christ, we won't do any of this because we don't want to. I really don't want to. Or I don't have time to or I don't even feel like that's part of my personality. Well, it, it many times and most of us, it's not part of our personality, but we're doing this for him because it's not, our life's not so much dear to ourself, it's dear to him. It's controlled by him. So if you can't get past the first point of being controlled, then none of the really, the rest of the motivations really don't matter as much. In other words, Paul said, look, before I talk about any of that, it's Christ, it's my love for him that motivates everything I do. It's just the conclusion that I'm not going to live any longer for myself, but I'm going to live for him who died and rose again on on my behalf and so we should do that as well can we reach out to others we should simply because Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us and we're not going to live for us we're going to live for him that doesn't mean he doesn't bless us my goodness he does bless us but we're living for him we're getting joy from him we're committed to him he's our Lord he's our master he's our servant I think we forgot that when we receive Jesus as Lord we receive him I mean as Savior we also receive him as Lord He's in control. That's what that means. He's in control, not me. So we wake up saying, Lord, what do you want? Not necessarily what I want. The second thing is we should be motivated to multiply because of a new view of everything, including others. Paul says, therefore now on we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. So he's saying here that, you know, in this passage, first of all, he says, I used to do everything by the flesh. Matter of fact, he said, I used to know Christ in the flesh. And you know what I thought about him when I thought about him in the flesh? He's a false messiah. Remember, he went around killing Christians because he didn't think Jesus was the messiah. That's why he killed him. He was thinking of Christ in the flesh. He's false. He's not of God. And he's no, he's no leader. He's no uh, the son of God. He's not that. That's how he thought of Christ in the flesh. He also thought of other people. Those are Gentiles. Who wants to be around Gentiles? I'm a Jew. I mean, his whole view of everybody was warped. But then he came to know Christ. And then what happened? He said, now I don't know Christ in that way any longer. I know him as he is the true Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is who he says he is. He's the Lord. He's the Master. And now I know that, not in the flesh, but I know it now in a different spirit. I've changed. 
I've changed. I'm a new person. Matter of fact, everything's new in me. I'm a whole new creature. I'm a no, and that doesn't mean like the zombies coming out of the ocean. That means a whole new human being. I'm a, no, I'm a new being. I'm, I'm a new person. All that old stuff, how I used to think and how I used to act and even my old desires and what I wanted and what I desired and what I thought and how I thought and how I perceived people, all that's changed, especially how I see other people. I see other people in a different way. I don't see them as male and female. I don't see them as Greek and Hebrew. I don't see them as servants and, and rich people. I just see people as souls that need to be reached like I was reached, that God showed me the grace of God and saved me, and now I see other people because I'm a whole new creature, I'm a whole new person, and I see everybody in a whole new light, that those are souls that need to be saved. Those are people that are hurting. I'm sure Paul said before, I may have just thought of myself, but now I'm thinking of other people. Why well, I'm a new creature. I'm a new person. I have new thoughts and desires, and, and they've all changed in and especially for other people. You know, we're not who, if, we've, if we're saved, we're not who we used to be. And yeah, we have the same name, and we look the same in our face, and our driver's license hadn't changed, and our address at home didn't change, but we should change because we're new. Those things that we used to think and how we act, that's, that's all gone away. And yes, it's part of its sanctification. I'm not saying it happens overnight that we're going to be like Jesus, but we're seeing those new things in our life come about day by day by day because we're seeing those old things pass away. You ever thought about a caterpillar and a butterfly? I mean, they're the same thing, so to speak. I mean, you know, the caterpillar, you know, he's like a worm, you know, and he's doing worm things, just inching along, inching along. And then one day, things change, and he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. That little inchworm stuff is gone. And now flight is better than inching along on the ground. Seeing things from above, flying from bush to bush, tree to tree, that's a lot better life than inching around in the dirt. But you know what? Many of us in Christ are still doing caterpillar stuff. I can't do this. I'm a caterpillar. This sounds like butterfly stuff. I mean, my goodness, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, you'd have to fly to do what you're asking me to do to minister to other people. See, we're thinking like a caterpillar. When God's changed us, that was what we were, but we're new now and we can do butterfly stuff. I believe because everything God ever did, I believe he did for spiritual. I mean, he did it because it was in his will. But I believe one of the major reasons he did it for us to get pictures of stuff. And just think he made that animal, I believe, just for that illustration to say, can you believe that animal now looks like this animal? They don't even look the same. They don't act the same. One can fly, one can't. One can do all this and the other can't because they're new. They have something about them that has changed them. And change them to what? To be what they are now. And we've been changed to do what? To be more like Christ. And what did Christ, what was his objective when he came? To seek and to save that which was what? Lost. That's what he came to do. And so if we're going to become like him, what is our goal? To have people come and for them to seek and save and come to Christ, for them to seek after Christ and for him to save them because he's seeking them and we need to be seeking them on his behalf because we're becoming more and more like him. The third thing that should motivate us to multiply people to coming to know Christ is we should be motivated to multiply because he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, I've given you a unique ministry that you can do it. Now, all these things, what is it? All the things that he's changed in us. That's what he just talked about. All those new things, all those things that he gave you to make us new, they're all from God. You didn't get all those new things just from you. You got them from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. On the cross, we became reconciled to God. And since we've been reconciled to him, he gave us 
the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Isn't that great? He's saying, look, I saved you. I paid the price on the cross for you. And I gave you the ministry of reconciliation. I reconciled you, and then when I did, I I did something for you. I gave you this ministry that you could do to draw people to Christ. I reconciled you, and I've given you. You can't reconcile anybody to God, but you have the ministry of reconciliation that you have a part in bringing people to God through this ministry. You say, I don't think I can do it. You're a butterfly. You can. We couldn't before. You say, it's not my personality. It's not mine either. (laughs) That's why he gets the glory. Because it's like he can do it, not us. You see, what, what a great verse that is too that says, not counting our trespasses against us. Isn't that neat? That he will not count our, tra- our sins against us. That when we stand before God, he won't see us. He'll see his son and not our sins. And so he's given us this great ministry of reconciliation that we can go and we can go out. And when he said that, that, you know, that he's done that for us, then we can do that and help bring people to Christ in whatever fashion that is. You see, it says that he committed that to us. See the last part of that verse? That word of reconciliation, I commit that to you. I'm empowering you. I'm giving you that responsibility. I'm committing that to you. I'm holding you responsible, and I'm giving you that privilege to do that, that you can bring others to Christ. You know, there's a young boy that said, I want a bicycle, I want a bicycle, I want a bicycle. And his parents couldn't afford it. I mean, because the dad, mom wasn't working, the dad was barely making it. And so the dad worked overtime and the mother sewed cookies and they made all these sacrifices. He was working late at night and she was selling these things out of a house so that they could buy the boy the bicycle. They bought his bicycle and then... Two weeks later, it lays out in the front yard and it rusts because he never uses it. They had made all that sacrifice for him to have a bicycle that he he felt like he wanted and now it sits in rust and all that work, all that labor, all that sacrifice, how do you think that parent felt? It's like, my goodness, all that work and you don't even use it. Huh. I wonder how the Lord feels when we don't use the thing that he died on the cross to give us. I reconciled you to me and I gave you, because I reconciled you to me, I gave you the ministry of reconciliation and I committed that to you. I'll let it rust. You didn't, you didn't cost you anything. No, it's, he, he gave us this. He, he reconciled us so we could have a part. We don't save people. <laughs> you know, we can only draw them to him. But we have that. You say, yeah, but I think that's mainly for You know, I think that's mainly for pastors and elders, maybe deacons and some church leaders. Do you see that U.S. up there? That's not this country. That's us. That's all of us. It's not a unique thing that he's saying that he said we all have this participation in it. Have you ever thought about how we're born and we're born again? See, all of us in here for sure are born or you wouldn't be here. All of us in here that know Christ personally as our Lord and Savior are born again. In other words, when we were born physically, we were dead spiritually. That's why we have no spiritual life. But once we come to know Christ, then we're born spiritually, and now we have a spirit life that's possible, which was never possible before Christ. So you're born, and when you get saved, you're born again. Well, this illustration can go on and on. You were born at a point in time. Now, you may have forgot your birthday. Well, I don't know that you would because you want the gifts and everything. But, you know, you could possibly forget your birthday. And your parents say, well, we don't know. We lost your birth certificate. But you're still born. And you were born again at a time and point. A lot of people say, well, I've always been a Christian. Then ask them, have you always been born? 
you hadn't always been born. You were born at a particular point in time, you know. And you may say, I don't remember everything about that. You still were born. And when you're born again, it happened at a point in time. You may have forgot the date, but you know, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I'm making you Lord and Savior. Please forgive me. Come into my life and take over, Lord. I surrender to you. And uh, you died on the cross for me and rose again on the third. I mean, you made that commitment to Christ. You made him Lord and Savior. It happened at a point in time. Yes, you, you, you have a, a beginning point in your life, in your physical life, and you have a beginning point in your spiritual life because it just doesn't, I've always, it's always, I've always been born again. I've always known the Lord. Well, you can't be that. It has to begin at a point in time. You were born hungry. You may have not remembered that, but ask mom or dad, and you know, you were squalling pretty early. You know, you were crying pretty early, and there are usually only two things, you know, that's causing it, and one of them is hunger. And you got so hungry, you got so upset, you cried and screamed. You were so hungry. And then when they fed you, you were good and quiet and satisfied. Why? Because God made you that when you were born, he made you to be born hungry. And guess what? That's never stopped for all of us. Matter of fact, we're a little too hungry too often. <laughs> we're, too, we're hungry more than, for me, more than three times a day. My dad said he only, uh, he only ate one time a day, all day long. You know, and this because we always get hungry, you know, and that's a proof that we've been born, right? I mean, obviously you can say, well, Pastor Tim, I know I'm born, I'm, I'm here, but we also know that we're born because we get hungry. And when you're born again, now you're hungry for the things of God. I never thought I'd ever be hungry for the things of God. I mean, I raced motocross, I did all these things, I thought, man, who would be that bored to be hungry for the things of God? But God changed you, where now you're excited about the things of God. Wow, I, want, I look at God's word, look at saving people, or not saving people, look at people getting saved. Look, you're excited, you're hungry for God's word. You're hungry for church, you're hungry. You see, it's one of those things that you don't have to be begged to do. You know, Rebecca has never said, Tim, you really need to eat. Now, she may have said, you really need to take out the trash, you need to go pick out that, you really need to pick up my truck you need, or car. You she may have said that, but she's never said, you really need to eat. Wow, that just comes naturally. She may say, that's enough, but she doesn't say the other. And, 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 it's, it's, and we're born again, oh, won't you please, won't you? Yeah, we motivate people, but it's like, man, when you're born again, you're hungry. It's like, that just comes supernaturally, the hunger. Oops. You're born into a family. And I know that there's a few maybe minor exceptions, but even if it's a foster family, usually somebody's waiting on you. You know, if it's your own parents or foster parents, usually somebody's waiting on you to say, you're, our, you're in our family. And either one, you're born again, you're born into a family, and you're born again into a family. That's why we need church. We need a family. You know, what if you're, when you're born, say, well, you're on your own, buddy. The doctor says, well, who do we give him to? He's on his own. Just open that sliding door of the hospital and put him on that mat and let him go. Would he have made it? No, you can't make it on your own, that young. And we think, I don't know why I can't make it in Christ. Well, you're born again in a family. We, we need each other. That's, that's part of being in the family of God, that we have dependence on each other. I got it on my own. Well, I hope you didn't say that when you are a baby at one day old. No, you don't have it on your own because you're you need a family. And we're born to grow. Didn't we grow? I mean, we grew because we were born and we ate and we did the things that were nutritious to try to help us grow. Our parents gave us and we grew. And when you're born again, you should grow and be more and more like Christ and be closer to the Lord as you grow day by day by day by day. And for the most part, we're born to multiply. Even in Genesis it says, be fruitful and multiply. No, not everybody maybe have children, and some people adopt, and some people don't do it all. And I'm not saying that, but in general, for the population of the world, we're born also to multiply. Because if we didn't, then the planet would stop with just us, and there'd be no other planet of people. And so it's true when we're born again. We have an opportunity to multiply the kingdom through our life. 
not just the preacher, not just the deacons, not just the elders, but all of us were saying we have an opportunity to help multiply the kingdom through the ministry of reconciliation. We're doing that. We're out there doing that, whether it's witnessing to them, inviting them to church, inviting them to invite your one so they could hear the gospel, uh, being a friend to them when they come to church, making them feel welcome, taking them out to eat, helping them move, giving them a meal, visiting them in the hospital, being a friend to them, bringing a love, showing love to them, that all of that is part of what we're doing to help grow the kingdom. And we're multiplying it, not for us, not for deals. Oh, look how many people we have. These are souls that one day will either be in heaven or won't. A great responsibility. So witnessing, inviting, connecting, helping. What greater privilege. I like what John MacArthur says. There is no higher calling, no greater privilege, no more urgent task then the ministry of reconciliation God is entrusted to every believer. <laughs> That's it. There's not a higher calling. There's not a greater privilege. And there's nothing more urgent. Because once they've died, it's too late. We have that ministry. We have that privilege. Why would he give us that privilege? Why would he even use us? <laughs> I mean, we're just frail people you got to ask him, that's his plan, that he would use us. And we should feel honored and humbled by that request, but it's there, and that's what we need to carry out for his honor and his glory. The fourth reason we should be motivated, if not those three should be enough, it's because of our ambassador position. Do you know y'all are all ambassadors? Therefore we, that's all of us, are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why don't you try that next time you're in a family meeting or a business thing? You know, everybody's showing off what they do and say, what do you do? I'm an ambassador. Wow. Really? Absolutely. Now, when they say where... <laughs> Then you got to be honest too and say, I'm an ambassador of Christ. And who knows if that may open up a door. You know, we are. He's made us ambassadors. You know, first of all, it's, you have to be part of a citizenship of a country to be an ambassador. And we are citizens of his kingdom because we're citizens of heaven. That's why it feels so unusual to be here. I don't think anybody got that. That's why it's so hard, difficult to be here. Because we're citizens there and really not here. Why? What are we here? We're aliens and strangers. Yeah, we're U.S. citizens. You have that on a document. But we feel like aliens and strangers here. I mean, this is getting, this society is like, man, do I belong here? <laughs> yes, to be a ministry of reconciliation. But it does feel uncomfortable because we're already citizens of heaven if our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life because that'll be what's open to show our citizenship. So, now that you're a citizen, you're also an ambassador of that kingdom. And what kingdom is that? The kingdom of God. Now, let me explain kind of something that went on back then. This, the, basically, the governmental structure during Jesus' time and Paul's time was Rome. You know, Rome was the authority figure. And Rome was taking over all of the world. I mean, they were conquering. They were the mighty empire of that nation. As they conquered places and conquered provinces, there were two kind of provinces that occurred after they conquered it. In other words, they were under some kind of rule. Roman soldiers came over and they took over. This is a province. They took over. So now these are all Roman provinces when they used to be provinces that were other countries. Now there were two kind of provinces, senatorial provinces and imperial provinces. Now, senatorial provinces is where they would take over a country. The country would submit and say, okay, we're under y'all's rule. We're laying down our weapons. We'll do what y'all say because you're the one in charge now. We're Rome. We're Romans now. We're Roman citizens now, so go ahead. Take over. We'll do what you say. Those were senatorial provinces. Now, imperial provinces were provinces where they didn't want Rome to be there. They took over but they were ready to rebel. They hated Rome. Uh, there was an uprising was very possible because they weren't very peaceful 
and, uh, and uplifting toward Rome. They were against Rome, even though now they were a Roman province. And so this is when Rome would send an ambassador to that imperial province. Because it's like, hey, you go there, you kind of bring peace, you make sure there's no rebellion, you try to bring them into a peaceful relationship with Rome, even though they're against Rome, won't you convince them to be for Rome? and that no rebellion happens. You were called an ambassador. You represented Rome because you're a Roman citizen, and now you're trying to bring these people to be Roman citizens, to be Roman, to be peaceful with Rome, and to submit to Rome. You see, that's what we do. We go to a people who may not love God, a people who may be against God, a people who've never come to know Christ and say, I'm an ambassador. I, need, I want to give you the peace of God. I'm going to show you the peace of God that you can have through Christ because you and I are ambassadors. This is a position that God's given us in Scripture to say, I want you to be an ambassador. And guess what? If you become an ambassador and you went to this imperial province and they said, get out of here. We don't even want you. Are they rejecting you or Rome? Rome. They weren't even, you were just the rep. So if they, rep, if they reject us, it's not us. It's the kingdom we represent that they're rejecting. So we don't, yeah, we may be sad that they didn't come to know Christ, but it's our kingdom and our king they're rejecting, not us. You say, well, I'll wait for them to come to me, and if they come to me, I'll do. No, Jesus said, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's a going. It's to say, hey, there's somebody that needs me. And, and I know we all fell in that because we get so busy in life that we just don't make that time. And, and here it says, go. Don't wait for them to come, but go. And that's just mean going in your way. You may have a relative that you meet one day while going. You may go to the store and meet somebody and be able to talk to them. You may have a coworker that you can talk. I mean, but you're going, but you got people plenty around you that when you go on your normal life, you got people that you can minister to, that God's put right in your path. And right, right where God wants you to be, he can place people there. And, he can, and you can even see him working where he's orchestrated somebody being in your life. In other words, you say, why did that happen and that happened? And now I'm with this person and being a part of their life. How did that happen? Because you went, you're going, and that's one the person that you've been called to be an ambassador to, and that's a person that you can reconcile to Christ. And you have that opportunity or invite them to church. Do you notice that word there? It says, we beg you. When we're ambassadors, it's so crucial in our heart that we just would beg somebody to do it. I mean, you don't see that word a whole lot in Scripture, but he's saying that these ambassadors... They're begging people. Now, we can't make somebody come to know Christ, but it's so urgent. Knowing what their destiny would be, we would, even if they say no, we may end up by saying, man, please reconsider. I beg you to think of this. Your eternity is at stake. I beg you, please be reconciled to God. It means so much to you, and it bothers even me knowing what would happen. You know what? Scripture says in Daniel about people who lead people to Christ. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Do you know what God's saying? Man, when you bring others to church, you bring others to righteousness, you help others. Man, the day you or with the Lord, you're going to shine bright like the stars. Nobody said amen to that. That is amazing that he would brag on a group of people like this. I like what Warren Wiersbe said. How we lived and served will determine the rewards the Lord will give us on the uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. We will share in the glory of Christ and those who have sought to win others to Christ will shine like the stars in heaven. Amen. That's what that verse is talking about. Man, you're going to shine, shine, shine. You say, I'm okay to be dull. I don't think that scripture would be there to say, man, we all got a little get more incentive to 
win others. It means so much to Christ. Why? That's why he came. See, he can say that's what was lost. That's, only, that's why he came. That summed it up right there. And We sometimes, and I know I do too, I get busy in life, even doing other church things. And sometimes we don't focus and we got to get re-motivated. And the last one. I believe we should be motivated to multiply because we realize that we receive, we realize what we received and we shouldn't want to keep it to ourselves. He made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Matter of fact, if you've got a birthday card from the church, so usually many times I'll put that verse on there. That means so much to me. Here's the way I read it, and you can put your name in there. I'll put my name in it. When I read it, you put your name in it. God treated Jesus on the cross as if he had committed all the sins of Tim Strickland. Why? So that he could treat Tim Strickland as if he had lived the perfect life of Jesus. You put your name in there. That's what that verse is saying. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. That's a praise the Lord that he had to treat Christ like he committed your sin and your sin and your sin and all my sin. That's why he was treated like that. A lot of people say the Romans killed Christ. The Pharisees killed Christ. No, I killed Christ. It was my sins that did it. Don't blame the Jews. Don't blame the Romans. Blame me. Because that's why he died. Was because of me. Not all of them. I did it. Because of my sins so that he could treat me as if I lived the perfect. Because that's the only way you can get to heaven is perfection. Jesus said be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That's the only way you can get there. And that's how I'm going to get there through his perfection. Because he paid for my sins. And we can put our name in that blank. You know, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He could have stopped there. That's plenty of information. He made his point that when we've been crucified with Christ, we don't really live. It's Christ living in me. And I live this way because of the power and faith of the Son of God. But you know what? He had to... Just because of how he thought about Christ, he had to add this one little bitty extra sentence, which that's, that was sufficient without this sentence. But Paul just, it always was part of his faith. Oh, yeah. The one who loved me and gave himself up for me. That, that son of God. He already said it was the son of God. We know who that is, but for him personally, he just had to write that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I can't get over this. That he loved me and he gave himself up for me. I never can get over that. And we never should get over that, ever. You know, in a poem, Francis Havergal, in 1858, part of the poem he wrote was, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? That was a poem he wrote about what Christ would be telling us. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me, this new life that we have in Christ. You know, you knew about the, the lepers. There was these lepers in, in Israel. You know, leprosy was awful. It was just an incurable disease unless Jesus healed you. And it just withered away your skin and you had to isolate from your family. You had to isolate. You had to be in a camp outside the city gates. People couldn't be around you. If people came up close to you, you'd say... Leper or unclean, unclean, so they knew not to get near you. So the only fellowship you had was with other lepers. Your children, your wife, your friends, your family, your co you were isolated from everybody. And so they're just sitting around. Of course, it was during a famine. They're dying because they're not getting any food either. They're dying of leprosy. They're dying of hunger. They're just sitting around moping. You know, what do we got? And they knew the Armenians had come in to, to come against Israel, this army, and they were thinking, you know, we're about to die. We got leprosy. We're about to die. How about we just go over there to the enemy camp? Maybe they'll give us something to eat. And if they don't and kill us, we're fine too because we're going to die. At least we'll die quick. 
win-win, right? Just go on over there and let, either they'll give you a piece of bread or they'll put a spear in your side. Well, we got to lose. We're going to be dying here anyway, whether it's leprosy or hunger. So let's just go on over there. And so they did, and they found out the camp was empty. They just had left all their stuff, all their tents, all their weapons, all their food. They just evacuated the whole place. And man, those lepers were like, look at this food. Look at this gold. Man, there's bread. There's, and they, they were just mopping up. They were taking it and putting it off to the side, coming back, getting more stuff. I mean, they were having a heyday. It was a feast. They had left everything for them. And it was just those few lepers. And they kept getting it and getting it and getting it. And then they stopped. from getting all that stuff. You say, was it wrong? No, I mean, it wasn't wrong. They were, it was the spoils of war. And I'm sure that while they were moving, they were, I'm sure they were shoving it in. But you know what they said? They said to one another, five words, we are not doing right. How can you not do right? You're starving. They got all the food. It's, it's open day to shop with a shopping cart. I mean, what do you mean you're doing wrong? How could you be doing wrong when you're starving to death and need all this food and stuff that they left behind? This day is a day of good news. Do you know what the gospel is also called? Good news. They said, this is good news. We're not doing right. This is good news. But what are we doing? Are you spreading the good news? Mm -mm. We're keeping it silent. We got all this stuff for ourselves. Why tell anybody? This is just too good. I mean, why tell anybody? They may take some of our stuff. It's great news. It's not like good news. It's great news, so keep it quiet. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. That's what they were saying. If we find out, if the king and all the people back there find out we kept silent, <laughs> they're going to nail us to the wall. Punishment's going to happen anyway if we just keep silent. Now, when? Later, next week, uh-uh. You only have now to do it. Tomorrow may not come, next week may not come. Whatever we lepers need to do, we need to do it now. What do you need to do? Let us go and tell. Let's go and tell the king's household. That's all you got to do, just go tell. Yeah, but what if the king's, it doesn't matter. What if he says, we're not going out? It doesn't matter. Just go and tell the good news. So they went back to the king and said, hey, the enemy's left. It's all for good. Just anybody can go get whatever they want. That's all they had to say. Whatever the king decided to do, all they had to do was go tell. That's all we got to do. Go invite. Go tell. Go invite to church. Go invite to the one. Yeah, but they may say, no, more than likely they won't. If they do, they say 80% will not say it in a mean way. That's what this is. I mean, they may say no, but they, you know, 80% of the time they're going to say it in a nice way. They'll say, they're not going to say, no, you little Jesus freak, you get out of my faith. That's probably not going to happen. They say, well, no, I'm, I appreciate you asking, but I, I'm, I don't believe in that, or whatever. Whether we invite, we got to go tell. We got to go invite. We got to say, this isn't just for me. Things are not going to work out good for me. I'm not going to go unpunished if I just keep silent. We got to do something. And these were just lepers and food, but we've got better food than what they have by far. You know, if you like mayonnaise, you're able to eat it because somebody found a way to let oil and vinegar not mix. Because when you mix oil and vinegar, 
you have to always shake it up because they don't tend to go together. And one guy come up with an idea that if you throw an egg in the middle of the two, it'll bring all and vinegar together and keep it together, and that's why you're able to put mayonnaise on your sandwich because of an egg that said, Mr. Vinegar, could I introduce you to Mr. Oil? And they came together, and then you backed off. That's what we are. We're the egg that can bring the lost to Christ, and we can bring the two together. You know, John the Baptist, he referred to himself, if you read the scriptures, as the friend of the groom. You know what that really means in our vocabulary? He was the best man. Read it. Jesus, John the Baptist said, I am a friend. He talked about being the friend. He said the friend. He was talking about himself in that verse. The friend of the groom. Who was the groom? Jesus. And he was the best man. Remember, he said, I came to prepare the way. All he did was saying, when he came to get baptized, Behold, the Lamb of God to introduce the groom to the world so he could bring the two together. He just prepared the way. He couldn't save anybody, but he could introduce the world to Jesus. World, here's the Lamb of God. Lamb of God, the world, and so he brought the two together. He was like a matchmaker. That's what we are. Any of you ladies ever matched somebody up? Well, when you do and you match them up, they don't want you to go on a date with them every week just in case you write that down, okay? It's, you introduced them, it's time for you to back off and let them have the relationship they need to have. Why did John the Baptist say this? He must increase, and I must decrease. I brought the two together. That's all I can do. See, that's all we can do is bring, show people Christ and we back off. I mean, it's a seed that we plant. It's an invitation that we do so that people can come to know Christ because we're just the matchmaker. We just bring them together. Now, some people matchmake and they say, you didn't match me very good. I'm not going to go out with them anymore. Well, that's between them and the other person. But for us, we bring them to Christ. And if they reject Christ, we've at least done our part. We have to be motivated to multiply and we have to do our part we can't say well it's somebody else's responsibility well I thank God that the church where I got saved didn't have that mentality and you ought to be grateful that the person that led you to Christ didn't have that mentality or you'd have never heard the gospel if everybody else would have said that oh it's somebody else's responsibility I thank God that People didn't have that responsibility, took that responsibility seriously for me to hear the gospel and for you to hear the gospel. Because it could be that that ministry of reconciliation could be that one person that God has you to have influence on in your life that you can invite to church. Yes, we can invite them every Sunday. Yes, next Sunday is invite your one. But what even a greater opportunity to say, would you be my guest? for next Sunday to invite you one. Just be my guest. I mean, to me, that sounds good. Well, I'm going to be there too. You know, it kind of nullifies the fear. Say, come with me next Sunday. Be my guest. We have all those names that are out on that cross for us to be praying for, that they would come. If you hadn't put your name up there, put it up there, even put it up in faith, saying, you know what, I hadn't asked, but I'm going to put that up just in faith so to be praying this next week for those people to come, to be a part, to hear the gospel message, whether they're already saved or they're not saved. You know, whatever God does in their life, that's between them and God. Maybe it's salvations, maybe it's rededication, maybe it's a church home. There's all kind of needs out there. But the moment is now. The time is now. That's why we've been placed here. For the revival that we see happen in our nation and in our world, it happens with us. It starts here at Believer's Fellowship, but it starts in our heart, in our life. It has to start in me to say, Lord, light a new fire in me because I've received all this stuff and I'm going to just keep it to me. 
what I'm doing is not right. I'm just keeping silent. They need to have what I have. They need to experience this. And so the revival grows, and the revival grows, and as people come, and we love on more people, and we connect with them, and we minister to them, and they say, man, this is what a family's really like. And they see a new life in Christ. I can't encourage you enough to continue inviting and continue ministering to people because it's others that we need to be concerned with. What about us? Well, others are ministering to us. We all get ministered to, but we put our focus on others, and then God ministers to, to us from other people. And you see that all the time. If you don't open your eyes, God is sending you people to minister to you. And so let's keep the fire of revival going that I believe is in our nation in all kind of ways and let it start in us. That's not really me. That's why God gets all the glory because it's not really you. <laughs> right? You said, I stepped out and I saw God move in a special way. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet, we have this time of invitation and... Uh, We'll open these altars if you want to come and pray with somebody. Maybe you don't know Christ and you want to know how to know Christ. Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you just want to have somebody pray for you or over you. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and between you and the Lord. and Whatever it is, just do business with the Father. We do this time of invitation so that we not only take the word that's been preached, but we allow the word to be real in our life to say, Lord... You spoke to me, and I want to make things right. I want, to, I want to be able to do whatever you've laid on my heart. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's something you're going through. Whatever the case may be, Just we're wanting the Lord to, just the Holy Spirit to move on each person in a unique way. Father, we just come to you, Lord, right now, and Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. Father, we pray, Lord, as we each, God, see how the Word spoke to us. Lord, I know you spoke to me even beforehand, Lord, that each of us, Lord, needs to light the fire. And God, I thank you for the, fr the friendliness and the love that we have here at this church, Father. And God, we want to see more and more souls come to know you, and we want more people to love and to love on and to minister to, Father. So, Father, I just pray as we have this time of invitation that your Holy Spirit would just move in our midst and do a work, Lord, whether it's whatever topic, whatever subject, whatever you're doing, whether it's even healing or anything, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would just go like a wind across this auditorium, Father, to do your work and your will in each and every heart. So, Father, be glorified in everything that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. As Brother Gary and Carl play, you respond as the Lord leads. to be a blessing we've been loved to pass it on been redeemed to share redemption we've been saved to sing his song we've been reconciled with Jesus and given ministry of reconciliation so that others can be we've been blessed to be a blessing
Father, we just come to you, Lord, that you are always the same and your love never fails. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy for each of us. Father, not only your grace that saved us, but grace that just walks us through even in the midst of failures and disappointments and even times where we didn't obey you, Lord, your grace stayed the same. And Father, we just are so grateful for all that you've done, Lord. Be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to close out with a few announcements. The first one is, you may have seen this board that uh, is outside in the lobby that says Student Ministry Fundraiser, and it's got a, a bunch of little envelopes on there. Uh, this summer, we have children's camp and we have youth camp. And we're not going to do bakery and, you know, selling cookies and all that. We're doing this board this year as a fundraiser for both kids and youth camp. You see, how does it work? Whatever envelope you take off, that's how much money you put in the envelope and you drop it in the offering plate or in the offering boxes. And that's how much money goes into those two fundraisers. All right. Now, Ashley built this for us. I told her to make those one, twos, and threes about eight foot, ten foot tall where you couldn't reach those, but no, we didn't do it. So anyway, uh, so anyway, if you feel led to help kids go to camp, then you pull off whatever envelopes that you want to that will add up to what you want to give and put that much money in, the, in that envelope and then put it in the offering boxes. And we'll, if I believe it, it looks like if all of those envelopes were gone, it looks like the kids would pay maybe no more than possibly a deposit and, or at least a, a major reduction in their camp. So camp, like everything else, has got more and more expensive, but we can help the kids go. And it, our youth and our children are our future, amen? If you hadn't seen that they, we need ministry then more than ever, then turn on the news and we'll see what all they're going through. So help a kid go to camp, whether it's kids or youth, we'd appreciate it. Also, lift group tonight and right after church. Uh, you can go to that next one. Uh, they're going to be in the uh, fellowship or in the fellowship hall and in this room. I believe uh, the morning groups will all meet in the fellowship hall today. We're doing way of the master. Uh, our evening groups meet uh, obviously in the evening. There's information out on the in the lobby on each of those groups and where they meet. And so be faithful in going to the groups. Also, uh, this Wednesday, we'll continue on with Revelation, A Peak in the Future. We'll also be praying for the Invite Your One more, one more time. And so come enjoy Revelation with us and see about the end times and what all is going on there. Uh, also, uh, Wednesday night youth group, they meet on Wednesday night and they've been growing and we just look forward. If you've got kids that are youth age, bring them on out and be, have that time of ministry. Also, next Sunday is Invite Your One. So maybe you may send a text reminder. You may get a call say, hey, you know, it's this Sunday. I'm still counting on you to be there. You need me to pick you up. You need me or whatever the deal is. Remind them that it's next Sunday. If you still haven't invited your one, there's still time. You can pick up the phone and call or go see them or whatever. It's never too late. Say, hey, we've got this special event. We'd like you to be our guest next Sunday, March the 5th. And uh, so Nina had... Uh, uh, invited her one, so I asked her to come and let me get your mic over here and give us a testimony of, of how God worked that out. Good morning, y'all. Am I on? No? It, it, oh, it wasn't all the way up. Okay, that's better. Okay, good morning. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate everybody's prayers. Because even down to the smallest thing of, Lord, give me a close parking place. Where am I? And, Lord, don't let there be a lot of people in the waiting room. In the 4 o'clock morning, we, we had an emergency. There was nobody in the emergency room. Every prayer, every text, every card that was sent showing your love, God answered those prayers. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And Henry wanted to send his love and appreciation too. But uh, I've just got to, Brother Tim, thank you so much. That was such an inspirational message to inspire us. That the God that created the universe can use you. 
He's looking down from heaven to say, hey, you are valuable and I can use you today. Well, let me start with the first one. I had to take my dog to the groomers. And I went in there and I could tell she had had a bad day. But I left and I didn't say anything. And I went back to the car and I said, oh, I got to go back. And I went back and the opportunity was gone. So I got back in the car. And then I came and went to the drugstore. And the Lord seeing my heart. The Lord sees your heart, y'all. He reads your thoughts. He knows that you want to live to please him, to serve him. And I said, Lord, give me another opportunity. So as I'm in the drugstore, I overhear two workers. I heard one of them say, I'm lost. She was doing the inventory and she was lost, but I took up on that opportunity. <laughs> and I went up to her and I said, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And she looked at me and, duh, you know. <laughs> but one thing led to another and I got to pray with her. And she said that she would be here next Amen. Sunday. Amen. Okay, then the next opportunity was just a couple of days ago. I needed to go to the grocery store. I wanted to go before it was nighttime. But we had drop-in company, so I'm just being patient. And then uh, our company left, and uh, so I told him, I said, I'm going to go to the grocery store. He wanted to go with me. I said, no, you stay here. So, and I said, Jesus goes with me and the angels. And so I went to the grocery store, and there were a couple of young girls there, young adults, I guess college age. And... Uh, I spoke to them. We were at the produce department. I said, I love pro fresh produce. And, you know, just that. And then going on through the store, I sort of passed her path a couple of other times. And then I checked out. And they were parked right next to me. Oh, Lance. And I am having a time loading the groceries because of where I parked. The door was sort of crowded or whatever. I said, Lord, you'll have to work this one out. And I don't know what to say. So finally I got the groceries in the car and they were still there. They were doing something with their car. And I said, uh, what are you girls working on? And she said that they had been pulled over because they did not have a light over their license tag. And uh, they, they couldn't get this magnetic light to work, and I said, oh, you need a miracle, don't you? So I just spoke a, a little brief prayer right there. But then after that prayer, I got to ask them, if you died right now, do you know if you go to heaven? And one of the girls says, no, I, I don't know. I said, well, let's take care of that right now. And I prayed with both of them. And afterwards, they were crying and hugging. Amen. And, you know, it was God's timing. Amen. God's timing, not mine. Amen. But I just want to encourage you, you know, they're out there. They're all around you. So Amen. let the God of the creator of the universe use you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Amen. Amen. Just want to encourage you in that, that it's not beyond any of us to have that opportunity to win somebody Christ or just invite them. I think uh, Nana said that they're going to come on March 5th as well, so praise the Lord. Uh, just a couple of other announcements. Men and women, save the date. We've got our men's and women's conference that's coming up uh, very soon. Men, it's called the men, the man event, and we've got guest speakers, Dr. Denny Autry and Termite Watkins. You don't want to miss that. Mark your calendars, guys. We'll have handouts next uh, Sunday, uh, but you can go to our website and get all the details on the speakers and everything else, but it's coming up on March 24th and uh, you'll be blessed by being part of it. It will be at the spring campus for both campuses. The next one is ladies uh, in, in April. Uh, April the 29th is our ladies conference. It'll be here at the Magnolia campus. It's Forgiveness, the Language of Heaven with Rebecca Alonzo. You don't want to miss that. We'll be getting you more information. It is on our website that you can check all that out and be able to register and sign that sign up and all the things you need to do. We'll be getting more information as well. But we want to make sure that everybody marks your calendar for this. These are great events for not just you to be there. Guess what? You can invite somebody. 
See, there you go again. You have an opportunity to be a minister of reconciliation. You say, hey, come with me to this conference. I mean, one of them's $10, one of them's 30 Hey, I'll pay your way if you need to. Just come with me, be my guest. Other opportunities that, will, that are just at our disposal to be able to help people. So that's why we do. We have these ministries to be able to reach people for Christ and be able to minister their needs. So mark those down. We'll be getting more information to you soon. Also, uh, to our first-time guests, we're just so glad that you're here. You'll take that little card that you filled out. I'll be out in the lobby if you'll take that card with us, with you out there. I've got a, a gift that I'd like to give you for being our very special guest, and we hope you'll come many, many more times and be part of our fellowship. We're so glad that you're here. Also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be faithful in your giving. You can see we don't pass a plate here. You can see the ways that you can give and be faithful to the Lord in that. Amen? You glad you came? Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, Brother Gary, if you'll close us out, I'll go yes. welcome our guest. All right. Let's stand together. We'll give our pastor time to get out in the hall out there. If you need to ask him any other heavy questions, just go ahead and ask him when you get out there. <laughs> this song is a sort of a Christ, uh, Christmas song, but it's Christ's song. It says, go tell it on the mountain. Let's sing that and you'll be dismissed then. Go 